So I'm Devorah Grazer, and I'm going to be talking about the VR AR patent gold rush, turning your ideas into gold, but also not getting run over by the stampede. If you have any questions at any time, please let me know. Um, also, I may skip some of these slides just in the interest of time. If you want me to talk about any of that material, again, let me know, or we can also speak afterward. And if you give your email address, then we can have a private talk later by phone. <coughs> the next one? So that's me. Um, I actually have 21 years of patent experience. I started programming when I was 16. I programmed for my PhD, um, which was actually in pharmacology. I did cell state modeling, and then I spent four years programming with the Human Genome Project, where I did image processing. I was also, however, formerly vice president in-house of intellectual property at a rather larger startup. So I know what it's like to be on both sides of the table. When you have budget issues, you have desires for patent, you want to protect your ideas, but you're not certain what's the best way to go with the resources you have at hand. Oh, this is what happens when you spend too much time with lawyers. Nothing in this presentation or in any material provided, whether verbally in writing, constitutes legal or patent advice. So why bother with patents? Well, I want to tell you a sad story about Pixite. Pixite produced the first native iOS photo app. They had a great first mover advantage, but they had no money. They had lots of innovation, though, so you think this would be a happy story. But unfortunately, what really happened was Pixite was smashed <laughs> by a competitor called Lightrix with little innovation, but lots of money. They had a huge marketing budget. They swamped Pixite. Pixite never filed for patents, so Lightrix copied all of their ideas. And Pixite is still struggling along today, but they've never managed to regain the advantage they would have had if they had filed for patents. So we're going to talk about intro to patents, how to protect your VR, AR ideas, and then why patents don't have to be expensive. I uh, hear laughter, but in fact, I will prove it to you that they do not have to be expensive. So what do all of these companies have in common? All of these companies have filed for patents in VR and AR. Amazon, which seems to be bent on patenting every single technology known to humankind, but also Snapchat, now Snap, has an AR, actually several AR patents. Microsoft, Facebook, Servius, Google, they're all getting into the picture. More and more companies are piling into this world and are filing for patents. So patents are the broadest protection for your idea. Now, you can protect your ideas in different ways. Patents are a form of intellectual property, and they have the advantage that they allow you to share your ideas. Now, physical property you can protect with a lock and key. You can lock your car, you can lock your house, but if you don't share your ideas, they have no value. So how do you share your ideas without turning into Pixite? If you file for patents, you have the best defense against copycats. Why? because it protects the core of your idea, and you can protect competitors, you can block competitors uh, from entering your space. In other words, you can protect your market niche, so only you have control over that specific area. So what is patentable? Well, the top quote is actually from a Supreme Court decision, anything under the sun made by the hand of man or woman. Basically, however, what is patentable is technology. So software, hardware, high tech are all basically patentable. Now, I've heard some people say that software is not patentable in the US. Yes, it is. Even business method patents are still patentable if they're written correctly. Software is most broadly patentable in the US of any country in the world. Other examples include mechanical devices, chemicals, drugs, et cetera. So technology is protected by a patent. The patentability rules. First of all, your invention must be in a patentable category, like software or hardware. I'll send the presentation out after, by the way. <laughs> it has to be novel, which means new. That's an easy barrier. But it also has to be inventive, which means it has to have the wow factor. Now, the wow factor has taken many hundreds of court cases to resolve, and we're still arguing over it. So it simply has to be a leap beyond what is in the field, and it's highly subjective. The fourth point, though, is also very important. You need to protect your idea by having it be well described in a patent application in each country where you want protection. So if you want protection in the US, you have to file in the US. 
but a competitor in China can copy your idea and sell it in China, but not in the US. If you want protection in China, you have to file in China. Now for VR and AR, if we're talking about software or software hardware platform, you might actually want to file in multiple countries. US, Europe, China, South Korea, Taiwan, in some cases, possibly even further. If you fail to file in one country, especially one where your competitors are, they can take advantage and they can launch from that country. Entire industries have actually been launched in the past due to the failure of the big incumbents to file in a certain country. So it is really no joke to uh, when you consider which country you want to file in. So what is not patentable? Well, music, images, books, or video, that's all copyright. Content is basically copyright. Names, logos, slogans, Coke, Coca-Cola, Coke the real thing. Those are all trademarks or names under which you trade. Copyright and trademarks are a much more narrow right than patents. Pat only patents will allow you to protect your concept. However, you can't patent anything that you want to keep secret. If you want something to be a trade secret, you can't file for it in a patent. Now, there is a way to a little bit have your cake and eat it too. If you only file in the US, you can file for a request for the patent application not to publish till it becomes a patent, which can take four or five years. But ultimately, it's going to become public. The deal with the patent is you must reveal your secrets to the public in exchange for the monopoly right of the patent. So if you want to keep it secret, you can't file for it. You can get a patent in four simple steps. You do a search to see if you're first, prepare your drawings and text. I'll show you an example of a patent drawing soon. It's really easy to do patent drawings. You file your application, and then the examiner checks your patent application. Now you would think with that simple list that if you file today, you'll have a patent tomorrow, but no. The problem is not the first three steps. You can do a search quickly, drawings and text, no problem. Filing an application, you actually file electronically online. You get a filing receipt, a number and a date that same day at that instant. Very easy. Here's where things slow down a lot. Uh, it requires a human to examine a patent, and there are not enough of them at the US Patent and Trademark Office, especially in certain very hot technical areas like VR and AR. But this is not necessarily a disadvantage. Why? As long as your patent application is pending and has not been examined, you can argue you deserve those broad claims. Until the examiner actually examines it and says, well, I, as the representative of the country, say this is what you should have, no one can say for certain you won't get those claims. Some startups have actually used this for a form of psychological warfare. If there's one startup in particular in one industry, whenever they file for a patent application, they immediately splash it on their website. We filed for a patent application for VR and everything. I mean, literally, they'll describe it extremely broadly. And how do I know this? I don't have to even go look at their website. My clients' investors see this, they panic, they come running to my clients, my clients come running to me. And so this startup has actually leveraged all their filings to bring investors to them and to cause investors to look at their competitors kind of askance, like we're not so sure we want to work with you guys. Another important point, once your patent application publishes, you can show enterprise, which is very adverse to litigation, they get very scared, that you are protecting yourself, but also that you have a defense. Patents are both a defense and an offense. They're a defense if someone sues you for infringement, you can then cross-license your patents. So if you have no patents, you have no cards at the table, you have no bargaining power. Enterprise is very nervous about working with startups which have no patents when their competitors have patents. Same thing with investors. I've actually heard sad stories about this. I've actually seen them published on Quora where startups say, well, our investors are talking to us, it all looked good, and then our competitor's patent application published. And now the investors, they want to pull out. So this cuts both ways. If you have it, it's to your benefit. If your competitors have it, it's not to your benefit. This is an example of a patent drawing. This is actually from Snap, one of their augmented reality patent applications. Um, you don't actually even need to draw the cool people with the glasses. You can just have boxes, by the way, but I thought this one looked kind of cool. So you see here, you have the glasses, you have the users. 
You have a cell phone as a, acting as a ba base station or computational resource. You have the network, such as the uh, internet, which is always shown as a fluffy cloud, by the way. It seems to be a rule in patents. <laughs> and then you have a, a server. So this is basically a client-server system with AR glasses. It's really easy to do. Like I said, you could just do it with boxes. If you can whiteboard your idea, you can draw patent drawings. It's really on that level. This is a system drawing. Another example of a patent drawing is a flow. So it's step one, step two, step three. And it's as simple as it sounds. So before you get a patent, first of all, your application is property. From the moment you file for a patent application, it is property. It has value. It adds about a million dollars to your valuation for every one you file. Approximately. It's a rule of thumb that investors use for startups. Your patent pending, mark your website and app. You don't want the psychological warfare to be against you. You also want to be out there saying, yeah, we're filing. We're protecting ourselves. If you file first, you can block others from getting a patent. Now, this is a very important point in the US. First to file wins. If I work on my idea for two years, and you work on your idea for two months, but you file first, you win. It doesn't matter how long I've been working on my idea. The US system pushes you to either file fast or publish fast. If you simply sit on your idea and someone else files before you, in the US, prior use or prior work on the idea is not a defense. So you could find yourself shut out of the market. Now, of course, if you publish quickly, you can also block others from filing. In fact, if you publish quickly, you give yourself a one-year grace period in the US which no one else enjoys. So again, either publish fast or file fast, but please do not sit on your ideas. Oh, question? So in the context of AR and VR, what exactly are you patent patenting? Is it the code, or is it the idea, or what exactly do you have to patent? Well, it would end up being the concept. It really depends on what you'd want to protect. So for example, one thing you would, might want to protect would be, um, Joey described, for example, the tools. So the rendering engines, you know, the, like the Unity 3D, the thing that make, the back end part that makes it go. Of course, there's also the hardware. If you're developing an application on top of that, and here I'm assuming you're developing at least some proprietary software and algorithms of, of your own, then it's the concept behind those algorithms. It is not the code, okay? Now you may use Unity 3D to kind of assist your invention, and that's okay. What we would do in that case, we'd describe how your invention works overall, and we'd say, by the way, this piece you can do with Unity 3D, or one of the other tools that are out there. But you're not limiting yourself to people only working with that. You're talking about the concept more broadly. Oh. Yes, sorry. What do you think is the, provision? is it worth doing a provisional patent before you do a full patent, or no? Oh, definitely. definitely. Yes, in fact, I didn't plant her. We're gonna get to that soon, but. Oh. The reason why the provisional patent is so worthwhile is it's much less expensive. It gives you a year to decide where you want to file and accept it all over the world. So if you file your provisional application within one year, you can file anywhere you want in the world. And it's a lot cheaper, it's also a lot faster. And if you make changes, then at the end of the year, you can add those changes back in and it's a much happier thing than if you have a regular application, then you're a little bit stuck because you can't just make changes again. You'd have to file another application, then you have two applications, it gets messy. Okay. You might get to it now. Um, so I, I read that it's sometimes good to have a, a clean start LLC to start one just to hold your intellectual property and your patents and to start the other one as an operating company so that you protect your Okay, you right. So the question is, do you want to have two separate companies for your IP as for your operating company? And the answer to that really depends on your investors. Your investors will say where they want the money to be and where they want the IP to be. The advantage of splitting them is, in some cases, um, you, for lawsuits and sometimes for tax benefits, there are reasons to split them. But usually at an early stage, um, startup investors I've run into want everything together. But it depends on the investor, though. I mean, if you can make a good case for it, they may say, yeah. Okay. So when to file. US only one year after publishing. Publishing can mean releasing your code, releasing your software, talking about in a TED talk uh, like this. This is considered to be a public forum, by the way. Um, publishing it on your website, being featured in TechCrunch or Silicon Alley or any of these other newsletters. Anything like that is a publication. So once you publish your idea, you have a personal grace period, just belongs to you, for one year in the US only. 
but you can't file in any other countries. Outside the US, you have to file before you publish. So then it becomes a little bit of a situation. Do you want to file quickly? Do you want to publish quickly? And the answer to that is it depends. You want to do one of them, but you would need to speak with someone like me to really get the best advice about what's best for your company and your business model. Now, the minimum what you need to file is actually not the uh, actual MVP or prototype or anything like that. All you need is a design of your idea. Remember that drawing back there with the boxes? That's the level we're talking about. So it's extremely broad and very basic in terms of the design. All right, so we're going to talk about stopping copycats for your VR AR ideas. So it provides a competitive advantage. As I mentioned, US patents increase the value of startups by a million per patent filed. It's also been shown to increase sales and employment by startups. Now, it's a little bit difficult to tell if it's causation or correlation. Sales, especially in enterprise, may actually be causation because enterprise companies are more comfortable working with companies that have patents. They know that they have a defense as well as an offense. Uh, and the employment may simply follow the sales. I don't know. But the numbers I've seen is that both are increased by about 30 to 40 percent. You could also simply mean that the startup has its act together really well, and that's why everything's increased. <laughs> but the valuation by a mil uh, increased by about a million dollars is a rule of thumb investors use. So why you should file for VR AR patents? Well, protection and defense. I've highlighted defense in red. We're going to get into the kind of gold rush and some dangerous situation in, the, in this um, patent area. <laughs> To be able to get an investment, to work with a partner, if you don't want to sell your technology, but you want to work with a partner under a licensing agreement, a patent makes that much easier, especially in the US. And you'll also have a better exit. In terms of IPO, uh, Facebook was told they didn't have enough patents. They had to go buy a bunch before their IPO. I think they got part of Motorola Mobility or something. But the point is they had to run around and buy patents or else they would not have been able to go IPO. If you want to exit through sale to a larger company, big companies like buying mini-me's. Little companies that look like them. And one thing the big companies do is they do tend to file patents. So if you have patents, you look more like the big company, it can help you negotiate a better exit. Also, it can help you with FOMO, fear of missing out. Hey, big company, if you don't buy my startup, your competitor's gonna get it. Oh, you don't want that? Well, you know, it's kind of expensive, but oh, okay, check, please. This actually works really, really well. And in fact, I've seen a number of startups get bought even they only had patent applications simply because of fear that one of the competitors would buy them out. Patents also give you control. You can decide how others can use your idea. If you want to license your idea for free or at a low price to, uh, say, nonprofits, go ahead. Patents let you decide to do that. You can block others from patenting your idea. Remember, if you don't publish fast, file fast, or else someone may file before you and you may get blocked. You can also keep big coasts from stealing your idea. Microsoft is particularly known for this. Uh, for example, if everyone remembers when XML was first added as a feature to Microsoft Word, you could save an XML. They ripped that off blatantly from another startup. But the startup had patents, and they went to battle against Microsoft, who then had to pay lots of money. If the startup hadn't had patents, they would have had no recourse. Because recently I heard of another startup complaining about the same thing, but because they didn't have any patents, they were out of luck. So don't get bitten by IP. So what you don't know can't hurt you. Oculus was sued for patent infringement. So not knowing about a patent isn't a defense. In fact, you don't know something doesn't mean someone can't attack you. And startups could end up being blocked from selling their technology. There's been some rumblings about this in the VR space, but more particularly in the AR space, where certain companies that have patents are starting to get a little bit more aggressive about asserting them. I don't think it's really hit its peak yet. I think now what happens is everyone's rushing to file, everyone's rushing to see what patents come out, and after that, everyone's going to rush to sue. That's what happened with the cell phone wars, by the way. Now all the companies are suing each other left, right, and center over cell phone patents. So big companies are filing fast. Sony, Microsoft, and Samsung have hundreds of patents in this area. Um, Apple and Oculus Rift, Facebook, are catching up. About 1,000 patents may be granted in the US alone in 2017. That may not sound like much, but you have to realize those patents were filed three to five years ago. The number of applications that are publishing is literally more than quadrupling or even quintupling every year. It's growing by just huge, huge, huge amounts. 
So when you see this kind of rush coming forward, if you see this, what it means is that the back tip of the iceberg is about to push out. Yes? Is there a place to find what patents are pending out there, like a database that you can search through? Yes, actually, one of the best ones I would recommend using to do patent searches, and it's free, is Google Patents. Okay. You Google Google Patents. It's like a Google Patents. It's like literally a Google search. What you do is you put in your keywords. You can also do an advanced Google search. If you type in advanced Google patent search, you can put in the name of companies. So let's say if you want to see if Apple has patents in a certain area, you can do that. The really advanced one um, also includes um, patents from like Korea and China and other things. It's a little harder to use, but the basic Google patent search is really easy to use. It's just like using Google, and you can use it to see what's out there. Uh, VR startups also need patents, so the startup NextVR, they have 24 patents and applications, 14 of which were published in 2016 alone. So they are also ramping up their filing, and they clearly have made this a big part of their strategy. It can also be a defense against big co-patents. A lot of the big companies are simply filing for everything and seeing what shakes out. If you file to protect your own stuff, of course, you can defend yourself later on. Uh, copyright is also important. I'll go through this quickly. Um, you can't use music or images of others because of copyright. Uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean AR app is very interesting. So this was put out by a professor. It's intended as political commentary. When you hold it up with the app open in front of the Pirates of the Caribbean poster in front of Captain Barbarossa, the app changes Captain Barbarossa's face, who was a pirate, to that of Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs. He's the CEO. So it's clearly political commentary. Would it be a problem under copyright? Possibly not because of fair use. It is commentary. It's a political expression. But simply willy-nilly changing things like that may at some point cause problems under copyright. So just be careful with that. Oh, question? Are you going to talk about uh, Pokemon? Ah, the Pokemon Go. <laughs> well, um, what question did you actually have about the Pokemons? Well, back to your the copyright. Yes. Well, you can't you can't use someone else's characters. So you couldn't use the Pokemon characters in your app. Only Pokemon can use the Pokemon characters or those they license to. There was also even some concern that. Um, if folks put up signs saying, hey, Pokemon critters have been found here or something, that might also be copyright infringement. I don't think Pokemon ever bothered with that, but in theory that could be an issue. So the, the idea is that you can't use anyone else's creative expression without getting a license for it. Um, by the same token, someone can't hijack your app and do whatever they want unless you give them a license to do it. Uh, you can't use brand names or logos without permission like Pokemon Go. So the best defense is simply to find out your rights first before you get sued. What and when to patent. So what do you want to patent the heart of your business? That part of your business that if someone else were to take it from you, you could not do without. You also want to patent anything that the user experiences. Users come to you for solutions. Users don't really care what back-end wizardry is as long as it works. So you want to patent those aspects of the technology that your users are experiencing so they stay with you and don't go to your competitors. You don't want to wait to file because, again, someone could file first and block you. Uh, one of the shortest times I saw between two filings, uh, Snap, formerly Snapchat, has a patent on this uh, function. When you hold down the camera button in Snapchat, it toggles to video automatically. So they actually got a patent for that. One of their competitors had also filed. There was a 19-day filing difference between them. Now, under the new rules, because the first to file is a new set of rules, uh, it's possible that patent could have actually been lost because of the 19-day filing difference. So nowadays, whoever's first to file wins. Doesn't matter if you're big, doesn't matter if you're small. You want to develop a patent uh, protection strategy. So US is best for software patents, and patents do provide the strongest protection. But one of the most important things is to talk to an expert and develop an actual strategy. Okay. So why are patents expensive? Imagine 
You could only buy clothing by going to a tailor and getting a bespoke suit. That is what patents are like now. Everyone charges by the hour. They do not have any incentive to be efficient. Now, small commercial. We charge only fixed prices, so we are very efficient. We use a lot of back office technology to make ourselves efficient so we can drop our prices. If you do the drawings and we prepare and file the text for a provisional, we will charge $2,500. We're able to do that because we are super efficient. We're not operating you know, the tailor underneath the little overhead light and sewing things together. We're actually in the modern age. Are you talking yes. about um, for one, a single country? That would just be for the US for a provisional application. You get your foot in the door. After that, we have fixed prices for further stages beyond that, but they do get more expensive as the process goes on. The idea is you'd want to file your provisional application, and then within one year, see, do you have your market? Do you have your investors? Um, are you getting traction? And then you could decide whether or not you want to go forward. If you don't proceed with the provisional application, it dies after one year. Actually, I think that's the next slide. Yep, there we go. Dies after one year, but it's also not published. So let's say you file a provisional application and it wasn't the right thing. You file, no market traction doesn't work for you. You can actually let it go and you can file another application. The one exception to that is if you've published your idea. Now you can combine publishing and filing only in the US with a provisional to actually get two years going. What? So I'm just curious when you say publish, Facebook publish? Publish is anything making it public. So if you put out your idea on Facebook, you describe it, you've made a publication. Anything on the internet would also be a publication. You know, the, in that case, no. It's, if you, the question is filing your own provision application. You can file it on your own. If you also are part of a company, you can, um, you can file it, although what you would need to do is file it first as an individual and after that transfer it to the company because you're not a registered practitioner. Um, however, the one issue with doing your own provisional is simply I've seen really variable quality. I've seen some people did a great job. I was very impressed and happy to see it. And I've seen some people do a really terrible job. So it just depends if you want to do it yourself then you're taking on the risk because one big problem I've run into is there's very few resources for independent inventors and how to write a provisional. The US Patent and Trademark Office has a lot of explanation but it is so bad that even I can hardly figure out what they're talking about and I actually know the business. And there are other websites that try to give instruction but it's really pretty awful. So like I said you're taking a risk but if you do want to do it you are allowed to file on your own. Oh, I see what you mean. No, if you, even if you file through a patent attorney, you can decide to have the LLC be an applicant from the beginning, or you can file as an individual inventor and then transfer the rights later. And that just depends on what strategy would work best and where you are with your investors and what you think would work well for you. Okay, but how about the investors? Would they care? Yes, they and the investors care. Okay. Investors always care, and they care quite a bit. Exactly. So you have to talk with your investors, and we have to see where that's going. Okay. <laughs> That is what he does. Yeah. There are quite a few actually companies like that. The question was what about patent trolls, non-practicing entities, we like to call them. Troll is such an ugly word. Um, there are companies that go around buying patents. And if once your patent is issued in particular, there are entities that will buy it from you. That's one reason why investors like you to file for the patent, so you have some property. If the startup doesn't work out, you still have the property behind them. And it depends on which area you're talking about. In some hot areas, uh, there are companies who will buy it. Also sometimes, sometimes you get the larger ones to buy it, not, a, not always. If you have some tech to go with it, it's easier. Sometimes you can get a company who will take the tech and the patents from you and who will go forward with it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Look, there are, um, there are companies that do that. There are co investors who will invest in lawsuits. And if you can work with them to get the patents and put together the package, they'll invest in the lawsuit to go after other people, even if the company that you know, once had the patents died, as long as some entity that's still alive owns it so it can be the representative in the lawsuit, they do do that. Um, but that's usually a bit farther down the road. As to whether or not it's a good business to get in now, I think there are enough companies like that doing it now that I don't know how much space there is. You need a bulk of patents for that to work, basically. Yes? How do you advise employees who develop patents and in their employment agreement, the employer says anything that's created here while employed belongs to you? Ah, question about employment contracts. That's always interesting. So here it depends on, if you develop an idea, first of all, if you develop an idea on company time and or using company resources, it obviously belongs to the company. If you develop an idea in the company space, then you have a problem. Because the, depending on how your agreement is worded, it may actually belong to the company. Um, in that case, there's a few things you could do. One thing to do, of course, is to you know, talk with the company, depending on how reasonable they are, and see if you can get them to turn over the rights to you. Um, another possibility is, depending on how long your cooling off period is, just to kind of keep the idea locked up in your head and leave and finish your cooling off period and then go ahead and do it. But it really depends on how broadly the contract is written. I do always recommend for folks, who, especially if you want to bootstrap out of a corporate job, you look on the fine print, because if they say anything involving software, for example, that's probably too broad, it'd be hard to enforce, but you don't want to get in that situation where you're fighting in court. So it really is good to look at your employment contracts. You know, even if you think you'll never bootstrap or whatever, someday you might want to, so it's good to look at the contracts. So the answer to that is it depends, and we can talk about it after. Now, one last quick thing on the provisional. It's not examined, has fewer rules, that's why it's cheaper. But let's say you publish your idea now, today. You can still file a provisional application within one year in the US, and that stops the clock in the US. You then have another year to continue the process in the US. But if during that year, you come up with new ideas, those new ideas, if they're not published, could be filed in a final application at the end of two years that would actually go internationally. So again, file fast or publish fast. Both can be to your advantage. So last slide, I promise. Can you do this yourself? Well, you can, but you have to know the filing. First of all, idea protection can be complicated. There's a lot of dates and deadlines, and there's no forgiveness if they're missed. You need to have a strategy. But most importantly, you have to be confident you're making the right choice. Not making a decision or a decision to delay is the same as making a decision. And you might be making a decision that would cause you to lose your rights. So at least talk with someone and understand your rights so you can make the best decision for you and your startup. Thanks so much. Question at the back. So I would say um, the question is, what do you do if you want to go international? So the international process, you could start with filing a provisional. Let's say you take our $2,500 package. Within one year, you filed something called the PCT. It's an international application that buys another year and a half. However, the cost of that year and a half is fairly expensive, even without more drafting, because the filing fees there are around, can be around five or $6,000, if not more, uh, just for the government filing fees. I don't even see any of that. It just goes right over to them. Um, you could, I would budget you know, 8 to 10 just to be on the safe side, maybe a bit more if you think you want to make changes. So that's the end of the first year. Then we have another year and a half, and that's where things really get expensive. You would probably want to budget at least 20000 and possibly up to, say, uh, 40000 That's usually what works for most software and hardware uh, startups. I mean, if you're a pharma company, that's one thing, but if you're in software or hardware, twenty to 40000 going internationally, now, we're 30 months, we're two and a half years from our first provisional filing date when the big money comes due. Um, but I would recommend keeping that in mind if you're speaking with your investors because then when you ask them for the money, then you would say, well, look, I want to do this provisional, then I want to do a PCT, and then I want to do this international thing, and I'll ask for 50000 just to be on the safe side, and then you'll argue. 
Um, but the idea behind that is you can then file in multiple territories if you have that money set aside. Um, well, that would be an awful lot. I mean, that's only if you're going to file like a lot, a lot of patents very, very quickly. I mean, if you have that kind of money, you can get a lot of protection out of it. You can develop what is known as a patent thicket, like that uh, startup, VR startup I mentioned, which is filing all over the place. Um, so if you can get that kind of money, that's great. But what I would probably need to do is sit down and talk with you about your specific situation and what we would need to do. Because in some cases, people do need that. In other cases, what happens is they have like one push to go international, and after that, they do follow-ups, so maybe, maybe not in all markets. It just kind of depends on where you are and also where the market's going. One reason I like that international application is it gives you time to see if all of a sudden a ton of stuff pops up. You're like, oh, I guess in, say, China, I guess you're filing in China. So you know, this kind of thing can be helpful just to buy time. So you had a question? Mm -hmm. um, how do you advise individuals to split costs or uh, manage credit? Whether it's more than one. Right. All right, well, costs, I would say, would be managed as part of the overall business. Like, this is, some, this is one, one reason I do recommend incorporation fairly quickly. I know some people advise against it, but incorporation means the rubber has hit the road and you have to actually set all this stuff out and it can avoid <coughs> misunderstandings. It means you have to have agreements. I find it very beneficial. Otherwise, someone said, well, he said this and they said that and it gets very ugly. In terms of credit, inventive credit's very specific. It's not like a scientific paper. You know, if you see like these computational papers which have all these authors on them, it's not like a scientific paper. It is someone who contributed to the inventive concept and that is defined in relation to what is already in the field. So even if someone built a platform, for example, they might not have contributed to the inventive concept. So for that reason, they may not be an inventor. And here what's important is, again, you want to have, this is the flip side now. Now if you're on a startup, you want to have everyone sign a really broad employment contract. Uh, that it turns over all the inventions to the company because the investors like that, but also you know that their security, the inventions do belong to the company. And then it is always helpful to develop a policy for this, which I've actually helped startups do. It's not hard, it sounds scary, but it's not. It's good to simply have as much as possible in writing to avoid hurt feelings. You know, people get stressed and their feelings get hurt and then things go bad. Oh, oh, Sorry. I question? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you want to ask? Oh, I certainly hope so. The legal industry has barely made it into the 90s. We can see 2000 on the horizon. Now, it is actually really embarrassing how far behind the industry is. Actually, KISS Patent, we are working on automating the patent and trademark filing process. So we're going to have our automatic trademark classifier and uh, filing engine open for alpha, I hope by the end of summer, and then open fully by the end of the year. And we're going to have our patent, at least parts of our automatic patent preparation and filing. Um, open for alpha by the end of the year. So we're looking for full automation. Um, a lot of patent attorneys do not see it coming, but quite a few do. And I'm on, obviously on the side that does see it coming. There is a lot in patent work which can be made very efficient, relatively simply, which we've done. But even the next level of making things more efficient is actually, it's definitely work, but it's definitely doable with today's technology. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of Mm -hmm. so are you, what are you seeing right now in terms of, kind of your business? Well, what I'm seeing is a lot of companies are going for both VR and AR in a lot of their applications. Um, there doesn't seem to be consensus yet on what's going to happen. I do think, for obviously for many things, AR has a lot of advantages on a practical side. What I see a lot of companies are doing right now is they're using uh, the tools for example, um, tools that are out there and improving them specifically for their particular application. So for example, it might be a medical application or it might be, for example, one classic one is automotive. Open up the engine, have the AR overlay. 
depending on what area you're in, what I think is going to happen is we'll have some folks who are going to be kind of jockeying to be the big platform provider. So the platform back end, like Unity, um, but also the front end, who's going to be controlling that and the, pla and the hardware platform that goes with it. Um, maybe actually Snap will be very big in AR. You know, I don't know, depending on what they decide to do. But then it's going to very quickly go into fighting for space for certain applications. So people are going to fight to be first in medical. Uh, someone mentioned, I think, for surgery. Maybe for surgery, there's a big fight already for rehab. Rehab is very big. Um, for education, certain kinds of education. Someone mentioned special education, but also education for uh, resource poor classrooms, but also for things like, hey, your mechanic is opening up the car, what needs to be done? For educational training for adults as well. In each of those verticals, we're going to start seeing a rush as people realize the value of the applications. So right now people are going more generalist, but I always see a rush, I already see a rush into control verticals. There are companies already trying to control verticals. And I think that's really where the fight's going to be. I mean, the platform guys will fight like the cell phone wars, you know. Google sues Samsung, who sues Apple, who sues Microsoft, who sues Ericsson, who sues Huawei. I mean, it just kind of goes around and around circles for the platform. But in the verticals, I think it's possible for, potentially possible, for a company to actually take control. Yeah. Well, so the question is, can you patent something even if you only show it works in one instance? In the US, there's a presumption that an invention will work in software and hardware if it's described reasonably. You know, the way someone of ordinary skill in the art would understand it, and there's enough details for that. Um, if you only show that one example works, of course, someone could challenge you and try to show other examples don't work. In general, unless you're talking about a medical application, you can usually put in just simply the design and later on prove it works. The exception to that is, as I said, medical and biology. Well, no, it has to be applied to certain technologies, so you do have to limit it in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's actually true, and some of them have been knocked down by the Supreme Court for being too general, especially in software, but some of them have been upheld. For example, content delivery networks, CDNs, are largely controlled by Akamai because they licensed in these patents from MIT. MIT professors say, hey, what a great way to send stuff around. Let's put stuff in different locations in the web, and then your computer will grab it from the nearest location, and we can have traffic distribution, and life is very good. Those patents were very general and turned out to be hugely valuable and they have been upheld in court multiple times. Other very general patents knocked down. It partly depends on the area, it depends on exactly how general you're getting, and also depends on what's already been done. So it's kind of hard. Well, that's really hard to know where to draw the line, yes, because you could conceivably, pat it, as long as it's implemented in technology, it can't be a manual method, but if it's implemented in technology, software, hardware, a combination of both, you could conceivably have it go across different, um, different verticals and different applications. So some companies are clearly trying for that, other companies are more specifically trying to control a vertical. And I think that both are possible, but again, it really depends if it's already been out there. There are a lot of published patents and patent applications right now in VR and AR. So you also have to be careful of that. Yes? You want to ask about KISS patents? Is yes. It your company? It's my company. Let's say like someone decides to work with your company. Mm -hmm. do, you take a, do you take care of like all the legal filings and the lawyers? And yes. 
So if someone works with uh, my company, Kiss Patent, that was a question, what happens? Yes, we do the preparation, we do the filing. We do all the chasing around of the US Patent and Trademark Office or of foreign patent offices through our foreign associates, like through China and Europe and all that. You'd only have to talk to us, we would handle everything for you and we'd let you know what needs to be done. Yes? Are there any special considerations to keep in mind if as like a VR startup our primary client is the government or making products for the government? Or are they just considered like another customer? Um, they would generally be considered to be another customer. Where the government can cause issues is in two places. One, if you get a grant, they sometimes have what is known as marching in rights. If you don't actually practice your idea, that is if you don't sell it or use it. Um, but if you don't have a grant, that's just because they're a customer, that would not say be an issue. Um, another point is if you're dealing with things which are considered to be uh, secrets, uh, secretive in terms of, say, in encryption or defense or anything involving national security, you must file first in the U.S. and then you have to get a foreign filing license. You have to do that anyway, but it's automatically granted unless you're in one of those categories. So if you're dealing with something for the government that's sensitive, I'd be particularly alert to the fact you need that foreign filing license or else they will come down on you like a ton of bricks. Yes? So my thought is, um, so I work with modeling and <coughs> and I realize the image of a model would be a copyright. Mm -hmm. um, would the code for that model be patentable? Not to say the code. The code would be protected by copyright also. But okay. the way in which you develop the model, if it's unique, okay. could be patented as a concept. 